Welcome to Move Your Mind. My name is Nick Brax, and this is a podcast where we have real conversations with real people and give real advice. Have you ever been through such a painful and difficult experience that you felt like there was no way you could go on? No way you could turn. There was just no solution. You just felt trapped and that there was no way out. Like you're in a prison cell without a key. You're in a cage. Today's guest has one of the most incredible stories of anyone I've had on the podcast. He's been through life-changing experiences, and one of the key things we spoke about was using pain and past experience to inform our future, to learn, to grow, to find meaning and purpose, and lead to the person that we become. Kyle Tyrrell is a high-performance coach who at the age of 15 was awarded the Australian Defence Force Scholarship to become an Army officer, ushering in a 24-year career as a combat commander. From bombs and bullets on the front line in Iraq, to the war rooms in Army headquarters and finally to the boardrooms of Australia, Kyle's been acknowledged as an inspiring and talented leader and strategist. He holds an MBA and in the 2007 Queen's Honours he was awarded the recipient of the Commander for Distinguished Service for Outstanding Command and Leadership in War. He left the Army at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And just a reminder that the Movie Mind book is now available globally. You can find all of the links at nickbrax.com book. And you can join the Move Your Mind community by going to moveyourmind.me. And we've just re-released Underbrax. We're donating a dollar from every pair to mental health. You can find the products at www.underbrax.com. Kyle, thank you, mate, for making time for interview number two. Um, <laughs> and ever, anyone, anyone listening won't know, but we actually, which I, I actually um, emailed you after or said to you after that I legitimately felt like it was one of the best, if not, you know, the best interview that we've had for Move Your Mind. Um, so it was, it, it was, I was upset that it was gone, but I'm also glad that we get to do it again. Yeah, no worries, Nick. Um, no pressure now. That you said the other one was was good. Let's let's hope that we can uh, get it back up there. But um, you know, in, in the mil- in the military, we do lots and lots of rehearsals before we go and execute. So um, let's just treat that one as a rehearsal. Exactly. So it's just common practice for you. You know, doing it this way. <laughs> exactly. Maybe even this one. We might have to do another two or three before we get to the main one. Just keep keep practicing and fine tuning, and we'll get there. You, you no, never but, um, know. Let's see how we go. Know, you never know. You never know. Yeah. See what the technology gods do for us today. I know. It's like it's it's that's the one thing with. I mean, it's amazing with technology being able to do this kind of stuff remotely. But it does. It seems like every for the podcast, probably one in every two or three something technical will happen, and you'll have to sort of work around it. But it does. You know, it does also allow us to, I guess, have a conversation like this while I'm in New York and you're you're on the other side of the world in Australia. So it's um, definitely some positives. Oh, a hundred percent. I think, you know, it's a tool, isn't it? You can use it for good or you can use it for evil. Um, let's hope we're using it for good today. Exactly. <laughs> see mate, we exactly. <laughs> we'll see, see what happens. Yeah. So yeah, before we get into it, do you mind um, giving a, a background on yourself? Uh, you know, where you've come from, what you went through and, and how you, you know, I know you've, it's a big story and we, you know, you told it last time and I'm sorry for making you tell it all over again, but um, how, how you essentially got to where you are today and, you know, what you're now doing as well. Yeah, 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 sure. No worries. I'll make it a bit shorter than last time. <laughs> I, think I, 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 liked, I liked it. I liked the long one. I, okay. I liked it, mate. Yeah, but, well, we'll you know, see. You, do, you do whatever comes naturally. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Um, so I guess uh, I... I'll start with where I am now. So um, I spend my time and really passionate about working with people, individuals and, and teams um, in the high performance space. So the high, high performance mindset, not not sort of physical high performance um, and, and leadership. So I work one on one with individuals, um, a range of different individuals across different um, different industries and different sectors. Uh, and also with organisations to help them develop high performance culture and to develop their uh, their, their leaders in their organisations. So that's what I do now. Um, I'm also studying psychology right now. So it's a you know loving that as well. It's a real real passion for me. Um, I'll probably be about 87 by the time I finish finish all of that. But um, nevertheless, I'm on I'm on the I'm on the I'm on the pathway. Um, but going back, um, I grew up here in, in, in Australia, in uh, Victoria, the same as you, Nick, and um, 
Uh, I had a, a fantastic childhood, great parents. Um, my, my parents really came from abject poverty, um, particularly my father. Um, uh, he, he had a, you know, particularly tough childhood. He didn't have a pair of shoes until he was seven. He left school at 10, um, so grade four, um, but had this incredible work ethic, was a very, um, very valued and very principled man. Um, and um, and I, I speak a little bit my, about my parents because they, they had this real concept of legacy. So both mum and dad, mum, mum left school at um, the age of 14, and she always had a couple of jobs on the go. You know, she would do things like she worked in a butcher shop for a long period of time, and um, they both grew up down near the docks, the, the wharves in um, in Victoria here, a, a tough place to, to grow up. It's been de- gentrified now. I wish we had the houses, wish we owned the houses now that they grew up in. They're worth millions. But back then it, was, uh, it wasn't it was as nice a place. But um, basically dad, mum, mum and dad sort of um, got themselves out of there <clears throat> and through two things really. Um, first one was extraordinary work ethic. Um, working, as I said, dad, two or three jobs. He was a, a detective in the police force um, eventually is where, where he went. Uh, he'd spent 23 years there. But when he wasn't working as a, a, as a detective, he would be doing things like packing bananas in a warehouse or uh, the other one that he did, which kept him super fit, was um, hand digging the foundations for houses in new housing estates. So... Um, there was that work ethic um, and the the fact that they they were sensible, they saved money, but they were able to save money because of access to social housing. Um, so we uh, we got our first family home in a place called Broad Meadows, uh, which is a, a fairly um, you know rough side of the town, I guess. Uh, but we were there, so that's where I was as a, a very young kid. Um, and then uh, through their hard work and, and their savings, they then sort of I guess, upgraded us a little bit into a house, into a, a, a middle-class suburb, I guess, um, uh, called Essendon, and that's where I spent the rest of my sort of teenage, uh, childhood teenage years. Um, but I, I talk a fair bit about my mum and dad because I think that um, they've had a big impact on me, and certainly later in my teenage years, when it came to deciding what I wanted to do with my life, it did have a big impact because... Um, they had an expectation, um, and I think in our, our last, uh, in our rehearsal we uh, interview, we spoke a lot about expectation, but they had an expectation, which I think was placed on to me, that I would continue the legacy. So they sort of got us to a certain point and that, um, you know, then it was up to us siblings to then sort of t- keep, keep moving forward. Um, so when it came time to... Um, you know, decide on a career. I was really keen and and really sort of passionate about heading in the direction of being a landscape gardener. And uh, that really sort of got battered back pretty quick uh, by (laughs) particularly my father. He was like, no. And this was back in the sort of the 80s where there weren't, there weren't, you know, reality TV shows uh, with celebrity gardeners or anything. Um, He sort of (laughs) saw it as a lawn mowing man. He was like, no, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, and then for a while there, I, you know, I sort of mentioned carpentry. He's like, no. Um, and then I said, well, I'll follow in your foot, footsteps, become a police officer. He's, you know, absolutely not. That's, you know, think think a bit bigger. And um, so uh, eventually what happened was um, I was keen to have a career that was more sort of outdoorsy and physical. Um, and my, my ex- the expectations of my family were that, you know, I'd have some sort of professional career. So um, I kind of melded those two together and I got exposed to the military through army cadets, which I really loved. Um, And I thought, oh, well, look, I'll, you know, I'll do that. I'll join the army. Uh, During that time, I sort of got interested in law and I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'd not the army, maybe law. So I went and saw mum and dad and, you know, maybe I should go to uh, uni and do law and, Dad wasn't real keen on that, being an ex-police officer. He, he didn't have a high regard for lawyers either. So uh, he was like, right. hey, go go with the army thing. So I applied for a scholarship. And I think that um, at the time my, my thinking was, uh, I'm not going to get this. You know, they only hand out a few. 
Uh, there's thousands of people that go for it. And if I don't get it, then I'll just default back to the law thing. I'll apply for law and see how I go. Um, to cut a long story short, I ended up getting the scholarship. They gave me $400 and a guaranteed place as long as I passed my final year at um, school, uh, which I did. I also got into law. So there was, you know, I, I had these two offers and I was very sort of um, very much keen on going the law route. And the reason why that was is because I'd become entrenched in, in you know, where we were living. Um, hmm. I was playing footy. Um, that was kind of following in my dad's footsteps. He played at a very high level for South Melbourne. He played um, in the uh, what, the VFL then. It's now the AFL. Um, so I was doing that. And I'd gotten into boxing when I was uh, about 15. Um, and I, that was a very, very big part of my life. I was training with a, um, a, a world champion called, a professional called Paul Ferrari, who's um, since passed away. Uh, but he was quite famous back in the 80s and the early 90s. And I was training with him. Um, my dad was really invested in that with me and supported me. He'd, he'd, um, he'd drive me up there. We, we met him through my dad. My dad knew him. Um, and uh, a great, great story of the type of man my, my father was, you know, very loving, very caring, very supportive, uh, but also pretty realistic, you know. He sort of mm. said, uh, I think boxing would be good for you. So he took, took me there for three months. And at the end of the three months, he said, okay, are you committed to this or not? And what he was doing was driving me there every day. I'd go six days a week. He'd drive me there. He'd sit in the corner of the gym and watch. There's no mobile phones back then to de be distracted. He would watch. And then he'd drive me home. And I said to him at the end of the three months, yes, I'm committed. Um, he said, great. Okay, so this is how it's going to work. I'll drive you one way to the gym. And it was 11 kilometres from home. So, um, yeah, so I had to run the other 11 kilometres. But he didn't, didn't drop that on me until I said I was committed. So I got really fit. Um, the <laughs> consequence of that was that it, it made life easier when I eventually did go and join the army. Uh, so, um, yeah, I joined the army, uh, graduated from Duntroon. I bounced around as an officer in a few different battalions, um, in the, you know, the infantry, the fighting side of, of the military. Um, I, um, ended up, uh, in the early two thousands in the parachute battalion, uh, the third battalion. Um, and in 2006, I deployed, Oh, 2005, I did a few deployments. I, 2004, I, I was in um, the Solomon Islands when they had their, their sort of crisis going on there. 2005, I did a quick deployment to Iraq. 2006, I did a big deployment to Iraq. It was about seven months. And I was commanding um, 110 soldiers. Um, and we, we were, our area of operations was downtown Baghdad. Um, 44 square kilometres around Baghdad, but we did operate outside of that, sort of went all the way up north over to the Iranian border and all the way down to Kuwait um, on occasions for specific missions. Um, so during that that time in Iraq, it was really interesting. Um, uh, the, the government had just been, the new government had just been elected. Um, Saddam Hussein had, was being tried and that was like 100 metres from where I was located. Um, and there was essentially a civil war going on. So the level of violence was through the roof. When, when we first got there, I'd get um, uh, intelligence briefings twice a day, which would take about 20 minutes. And then the, the ramping up of the violence in my 44 square kilometre area of operations was such that those briefings were taking a couple of hours. So we had to sort of change the metrics and say, to them, don't brief me on anything that's sort of less than 20 deaths or, you know, a major, major incident. So it was uh, fairly significant. Um, whilst we were there, we were extraordinarily busy, hundreds and hundreds of missions into the red zone. Uh, one of my soldiers um, died uh, while I was there, um, which was, you know, had a, a significant impact on me and, and, in, and my later life. And other things also occurred, um, as you can imagine, it was fairly hectic. Uh, one of the things that at the time was, um, you know, interesting, but I didn't think would impact me later in life did, and that was uh, a rocket hitting our, um, our accommodation. I was asleep in a room, rocket hit that accommodation. And um, later in life, I found, that, I found that that specific incident sort of crept up on me and, and caused issues. So... Um, 
eventually in uh, 2009, uh, so I went on and I, I was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Um, around 2009, I was having difficulty coping. Um, so uh, fortunately, I was working for a brigadier in Army headquarters at, at the, around 2007, who I suspect had uh, been suffering with PTSD himself um, from a helicopter accident that he was involved in. He won a Star of Courage um, there, pull, pulling people out of a burning helicopter. Uh, I think he recognised some things in me, and, and so he um, encouraged me, well, he you know, more than encouraged me to go and seek some help, um, which I did, and that sort of uh, that sort of kept me hanging in there for the next couple of years. The, the issue that I had was that uh, I didn't want to talk to anyone at work because it would damage my career. I didn't want to talk to, um, you know, the, the woman that I was married to at the time because um, it was pretty clear that was going to damage her view of our of our of our marriage, um, and and so I wasn't talking to anyone, and uh, sort of persisted with it for years um, until two thousand nine, where I just wasn't coping, and so um, you know that led to uh, me getting to the point where I was I was very 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 low, and I couldn't see any value in myself or me being around. Um, I was having severe problems sleeping, um, you know, in particular, and I think that compounded everything. So uh, it started off, I would go to bed and then wake up all the time with nightmares, and then it became I didn't want to go to bed because I knew what was going to happen. So I was getting very, very little sleep. Um, and, yeah, I said, you know, uh, my marriage broke down. Uh, my wife, my wife at the time left with the children, so I'd kind of lost who I was, lost my family, lost a lot of support, um, didn't want to talk to anyone, was pushing everyone away and avoiding them. Um, and, uh, yeah, just got to this really low point where uh, I don't know why, but an idea came into my mind that, you know, this would all be much better for everyone if I wasn't around. And I had this moment of clarity which felt really good. It's like, yeah, that's the answer is you just kill yourself. That's so obvious what I should be doing here. So, um, you know, and I actually felt really good about it for the first time. I kind of had a plan and a way ahead. And so um, I started to, you know, organise myself. I, I had a rifle. I got that, loaded it, um, worked out where I was going to go and do it so I didn't make a mess at home and uh, uh, identified where in the – the state park nearby, I was going to go and do it. And I was walking, I was actually walking out the door um, with the rifle to jump in the car and go and do it, feeling pretty good about myself. Um, and to get out the door, you have to sort of open the door and, and there was like this side table thing, which you, you sort of, as you, you turn your body, you sort of faced it. And sitting on that side table was a photo of my, my children. And um, I had another <laughs> realization that um, that I couldn't do it to them. That there was this realization of, hang on a second, this wouldn't be relief for them. This would be torture for them for the rest of their life. And so uh, that sort of rebounded me back into feeling particularly bad. And uh, from there, I sort of I sought help, and uh, eventually um, ended up discharging from the military in 2011. Um, and then that kind of, um, you know, led into the dark years, uh, the four or five years of just being really low, not knowing where I was, not knowing who I was. I had this identity crisis, like uh, no longer a soldier, you know, don't want to be a victim, um, you know, trying to find out who I was at the same time as dealing with the PTSD. And so um, those sort of four or five years, um, what I didn't realise was incrementally I was coming out of it. I was incrementally getting better because I was doing work on myself and I was very slowly, very incrementally, I was getting out of it. And eventually, um, eventually I was, I was sort of good enough to, to, to look forward and uh, took on um, some really great work in the Middle East as a security risk consultant um, with the NSA and uh, ended up living in the Middle East for a little while doing that was, um, was a good time. I, I came back to Australia and when I came back to Australia is, is really when 
I started to get into the uh, the, the coaching and, and mentoring space. Um, as I said, since then, I've enrolled in psychology and really enjoying that. I chair a couple of not-for-profits that work in the veteran space, specifically around welfare and homelessness. And, um, and life is bloody fantastic. And that's where we're at now. Well, mate, hearing it again, it, it, it's, it's an amazing story. And, you know, I was still sort of hanging off every word hearing that because, it's, you know, I think it's just, again, thank you for sharing it as well and being so open. And um, it is, it's just the, the things you've been through, the lessons you've learned, the, the fact that you are able to talk about it and share it and help other people by sharing that message is so important as well because I know on different levels, even, you know, what you were talking about with identity, you know, so many people – athletes have a huge issue with that when they finish their career and you spend such a long period of your life identifying as this one thing getting adulation for it being good at it and then you move on from that and who are you you know what do you do and so many things that are relatable and i think it's really important we talk about this and and it gives you hope hearing hearing that you know you reached that point and um were able to not only work through it but come out the other end and find you know connect all of the pieces to find your calling and you know be doing what you're doing now so yeah really amazing story and you know appreciate you sharing it again um how important do you think it is to um to learn from the these different experiences and then you know find a way to apply that in the real world well well, it's critical i mean really what I've come to learn is that it, it's not important. It just is life. That That's what, what actually <laughs> creates a life. You know, um, uh, last time we spoke, we ended up talking a lot about expectations and I think we're, we're probably going to end up back there again. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. There's this expectation. I think that we, that we go through life and um, if it's not all perfect, then it's a bad life or, you know, it's wrong or something like that. But it's, it's, that's the way it's meant to be. Sometimes it's, well, a lot of the time it's really difficult to intellectualize that, to be able to sort of go, oh yeah, yeah, I understand. Particularly in the moment, you know, if Mm -hmm. you had, you know, if I could go back and be me now talking to me back then saying, you know, look, mate, this is the way it's supposed to be. That would have been very unhelpful. (laughs) I'd be like, no, it's not. You don't know what I'm going through. This is painful and I don't want to be here. And that's a natural. You'd be be like, fuck off. You know, I'm I'm fucking in pain. Yeah, I don't fucking believe you. Yeah, leave me alone. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 100%. But, you know, and the reason why we would have, you know, I would have had that fuck off attitude, you idiot, is because, um that's that's the the fighting you know i'm going to fight my way out of this you know it's mm-hmm. it's not mm-hmm. so at times you feel like you're giving up but that resistance to what's going on in your life the suffering in your life i think is that is is you know you, you don't want that resistance to be so great that you end up spiraling and being in that suffering forever but it's important to have that resistance because that's the spark that gets you to look for other ways, you know, like what do I need to do to get out of this? How do I need, what do I need to do? Who do I need to be? Who do I need to have around me to change the way that I feel or, you know, where I am? And I think that the the learning comes later. And a part of that learning, hopefully for us, is that we look back and we sort of, um, we, we can look at it in a less emotional way and, sort of say that that was for no no matter how bad it was, there were some positives that come out of that. And, you know, on the scale of happiness, um, I'm never going to be a hundred. That's unrealistic. Um, I was down near zero and the only way was up and I've gone up. And what I learned from that is that if I'm ever there again, the only way is up and I've got some tools. I know how to go there. I know how to sort of, you know, contextualize it better and work my way through that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think the expectation that we shouldn't be there makes, it's like, um, 
you know, the Buddhists call it this, I think they call it the second arrow. It's like you've been shot with an arrow. That's the initial suffering. And then you put a second arrow in yourself saying, you know, this suffering, you suffer about the suffering, you know, this suffering, I shouldn't be here. You know, look how bad this is rather than just mm. accepting the first one and dealing with the first one. So for me, I think um, the, the acceptance is a huge, a huge thing in my life. It's about understanding that um, there is going to be peaks and troughs in life and that um, when I hit the troughs, I'm not going to like it, but I don't need to. Um, and eventually there will be gems that come out of it that enrich my life. And they might be very small or they might be quite significant, but um, you can't expect to go surfing without there being peaks and troughs. And life is like surfing, I think. Yeah, you, you simply can't. And, and like you said, you know, expectations, it was such a big thing, big part of our initial conversation. And <laughs> um, it, it does drive a lot of things. I, you know, I completely relate and, expectations from other people from what you put on yourself and a lot of my life is you know I've had suffering from that but then like you were saying it leads then to finding the thing that you actually want to do and without that expectation without that suffering without that difficulty you wouldn't go and find it so it's it's an interesting sort of thing where you can only um find retrospectively sort of find that lesson and understand it and 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 then learn as well that you probably wouldn't have it any other way um anyway because it's just necessary that you know we don't if we're too sheltered and we try and avoid pain and not have different experiences not fall flat on our face not try things and fail and you know pull ourselves back up how are we going to build resilience how are we going to find who we are how are we going to find what we actually want to do uh, we're just going to sort of be numbing ourselves and just coasting through life. And, you know, that's not happiness either. So it's sort of life does equal pain to a degree. And it's not about, you know, trying to just be in this feeling of elation all the time. It's about, you know, f trying to find meaning and trying to find what is it that, you know, how am I going to navigate it and how much, um, how, how much suffering can I handle to, to get to that, to that point and not trying to avoid it. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. And you mentioned the magic word there, happiness. You know, and uh, I think that's the the greatest expectation that brings us down as humans. Um, that's yeah. out there is you know uh, this is is what happiness means to us and how we define it. Um, so I, you know, m my view is that that we we shouldn't really be that that shouldn't be the goal, happiness. Um, so. Happiness is more an experience that we have, um, mm -hmm. and and it, it's an experience of positive thoughts. That that's what it is, and you can't sustain an experience. Like we keep moving forward, we keep changing. The world around us changes, so happiness is um, transitory. It comes in and it and it goes out. Um, whereas I think you know what we what we really want is contentment which is sort of a, a deeper feeling of um, peace or, or calm, gratitude, satisfaction, you know, this contentment that can sit in you for a long period of time. Um, I think that, that that's what, what we aim for. And, and the difficulty is that um, as humans, we kind of, if you think of it as a continuum and at one end is the extreme of contentment and um, you know, there'll probably be people listening to this who pull me apart for it, but let's call the extreme of contentment a person who has no expectations whatsoever. They are wholly and solely present in the in the moment, um, which is extremely difficult to do in the real world, right? Unless you want to become a Buddhist monk and then even they don't, you know, they, they have expectations of, you know, being fed and things like that. So there's that end. And so we've almost sort of said that um, that is almost unattainable. I'm going to say almost. It probably is unattainable 100%. And then at the other end of the continuum is um, unbridled ambition. So striving for success, which most of, most of the time, the, particularly the way we're brought up in Western culture, um, that is like the same as saying happiness. 
this this unbridled ambition. I want a bigger house. I want a better job. I want more money in the bank. I want my kids to go to a private school. I want, you know, like it's ambition, right? Mm -hmm. But at the extreme end, it's unbridled ambition where you never live in the moment. You're always about what's next. Um, and so it's 100% expectation and it's 100% in the future. And yet we live life in the present. And so that's almost unattainable as well. Although a lot of people, particularly in Western cultures, are moving towards that end. Mm -hmm. I think that what what we need to do is try and, you know, on that continuum, it's a dialectic um, uh, problem. What we need to do is to be able to accept that both of those extremes exist and create a middle ground out of the two where we can find contentment whilst also having a degree of realistic ambition. So coming into the middle and sort of saying, okay, it's realistic ambition, it's realistic commitment sort of down this end, we kind of bracket it realistic ambition and then we've got some uh, um, realistic contentment and we're going to fall somewhere in that sort of bracket in the middle depending on where we're at and how we're thinking and feeling throughout that day and when people talk about life balance that's what I think of is sitting in that mm. bracket of sitting between realistic contentment and realistic ambition I don't think about you know uh, a morning routine or, you know, um, it means that you've got to get, you know, you've got to go to the gym. It's, it's that, that's sort of the execution of what a definition of um, realistic um, contentment and realistic ambition is, you know. Um, but where, where I think where we want to set, sit is in that bracket. That, so that's what it means to me. And I, I think uh, we conflate the term happiness with success mm -hmm. and ambition and we start chasing that, we end up down that end of the spectrum and we lose that contentment factor. Absolutely. And it's um, so easy to go down the path of the just complete ambition side because we're taught to do that. You know, the, the yeah. Western world <laughs> teaches us that's what you are meant to do. You know, mm. if you want to be successful, if you want to fit in, if you want to feel good about yourself, if you want to be happy, happiness is going to be at the there's going to be a pot of, pot of gold at the end of this ladder. If you just keep pushing for long enough, you're eventually going to be content and be okay, which everyone sort of at the end of the day, we all want to find that contentment, but you can never get there going down that side. So I think I completely agree with what you're saying that it's balancing it and finding that middle ground and, you know, a daily proposition of you've got to be self-aware and assessing these things. And if you're attaching it to no, but I'm only, content and stable when I've got that regular routine, that rigid, you know, getting up at this time, exercising, meditating, doing these different things that we sh are good for us. And hopefully we should be doing some of them um, that can become, and I know I've struggled with that where I've gone to do these things that help that help me. You then, they actually then become a stress in of themselves because then you're putting pressure that, okay, now I've got to do all, I've got to achieve all these different tasks in my day. And I've also got to get my, X amount of exercise done and get this done and do this and do that. And how am I going to fit it all in? And then you're overwhelmed. And so it's like, it's a finding that balancing act, which is really difficult because you've got to be very honest with yourself, very aware and, and not influenced by the outside world, which is, I think the hardest thing. And, and I think also like, like you were saying, I, heard, I can't remember who I heard talking about it. It was a guy that had been a monk and he was saying, it's actually not that hard to go and, become a monk because you're in that environment you've got no temptation no stimulation around you, you can just surrender you know it's all you you sort of that's that's your that's the only option and then it's also easy to go down the other end where it's just blind ambition you know you become hedonistic you're trying to absorb everything around you the hard bit is what you're talking about how do you operate in the world and find that balance that's like not an easy thing to do but i think that's the sweet spot where you know we should be all trying to navigate towards yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, Nick, when I speak to people about this, um, what I occasionally get um, is someone who says, so what, what you're telling me is that I need to lower my standards. <laughs> I yeah. think that says a lot about where our mindset is. You know, I need to lower my standards. It's like, no, I think you need to, um, have, you know, operate in the range of realistic expectations and, 
you know, I love AFL football um, and I'm 53 years old. So, you know, if I set a goal and, you know, you know my view on how, go- you know, the, the whole goal thing. Um, but if I set a goal next year, I'm going to play uh, first grade AFL football, Australian rules football for the Geelong Football Club, you know. Um, there'd probably be some good things that came out of that. Um, I'd probably get fitter. Um, I'd probably, yeah, I don't know. But um, but we all know that I won't play. That will never happen. Um, and some people's goals are, um, or, or their expectations are setting them up to be disappointed. Um, and so, you know, what might be a more realistic one is for me to, you know, aim to play in the state representative side in the golden oldies, the over 50s. That would be hard. That would be hard to do off a of mm-hmm. zero, um, you know, baseline. So it would be challenging. And I'd probably get all, all and more that I wanted out of that to, um, to improve my life as opposed to setting something completely unrealistic and mm-hmm. failing. And, you know, the people say, you know, f- fail first, fail fast. I, I don't know about that. I, I'm not aiming to fail. I'm open to failing. I, I know that it will happen, but I, I, it's not my goal to fail. My goal is to, to try and set something that's achievable but challenging and that I can actually reach. And the way that we do that is counterintuitive to the way that a lot of, you know, people out there in the personal development space suggest you do it. So what they suggest, by and large, you pick a book up and a lot of them will tell you that you need to do more. Mm -hmm. Change change your morning routine, get up at 4.30, do this, do that, do that. You know, you don't need eight hours sleep, only sleep five hours. And these people put themselves up as the model um, and if that, in fact, is what they're doing, then that's great because it works for them. But m- we all know that doesn't work for most people. And the way, to, the way to achieve goals is to make them really, really easy to achieve. And you're going to achieve them. And mm. what I mean by that is, you know, someone will say, well, then why have the goal? It's not inspiring. Well, you can have the goal, but then you do something that we call in the military chunking down. So, you know, if my goal is to play in the golden oldies next year and represent the, the state team, I mean, that's, that's an extraordinarily challenging goal. Um, that's way less than playing in the, you know, the first grade AFL team, but it's realistic. I could possibly do it. Mm-hmm. So um, it's challenging. What I then do is I chunk it down to really, really easy steps that I know I'm going to do every day and in every moment. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I, re- I remove the resistance in the steps that lead up to that bigger goal as much as I possibly can. Because, you know, there's a lot, there's people out there also that will be saying you need more discipline. The problem with that is like discipline, it's, 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 um, it's not limitless. <laughs> you will wear it out. You know, you need to call on discipline when it's absolutely necessary, when there's nothing else. I need to be disciplined, you know, or in tiny little bursts, like in the morning where it's like um, the goal is, the the goal in the morning is not to get out of bed at at 4.30 and do an hour session. The goal is just get out of bed. That's the first goal, tick that off. And there's even resistance to that. And mm-hmm. you need a little bit of discipline just to overcome that. But if the goal is to get out of bed and do a smash session for an hour, you'll need a lot of discipline to get over that. So tick it off. I'm out of bed. Now I need to decide whether I'm going to go for this next little chunk down goal, which is go to the gym. Don't not work out, but just turn up at the gym. So, yep, I tick that off. And the next one is and get through the first 15 minutes of a workout. And if I don't feel like it, I'll leave after that. Then you get through the first 15 minutes and, and by constantly achieving, you gain momentum and you overcome the resistance and you rely less on discipline. So I think that was a very long way of um, sort of, you know, jumping in and saying that I, in, in many respects, um, we look at it the wrong way. We look at it from a negative bias point of view on, you know, what are you not doing? So that whole question about, so I'm, I'm going to lower my standards. 
that's looking at it from the perspective of what you're not doing, sort of change that perspective to a positive one to what, what are you doing? What will you achieve? I, I think it's, yeah, really important the way you explained it because it makes a huge amount of sense. I know, you know, I can put my hand up and I fall victim all the time to what you're saying of aiming, having these big ambitions, aiming too high and getting overwhelmed. And the ironic thing is what happens is you get so overwhelmed and despondent and frustrated that you actually end up doing nothing. You throw in the towel or you have a breakdown or you just get burnt out. Uh, whereas if you do the small steps and make it achievable, it's actually enjoyable because it feels good when you know that if you work, you can work hard, but it's actually tangible. There's actually something that you know is achievable. Mm. And if you, if you can do that, then you're more likely, or I guess this was the next part of the question I wanted to ask you. Do you, do you think the people that, you know, a lot of us are looking towards where we're like, you know, we want to achieve that level of success. Do you think they got there because they're doing what you're talking about? They didn't, they didn't sit there and think, okay, I want to, um, from, you know, from point zero become the, a gold medalist. I'm going to, I just, they, they chunked it down as well. Do you think that's what most of these successful people have done continually? That's part of the process for them. Yeah, I think the science would tell us that's exactly what they did. They may not intellectually and cognitively mm. sit there and say, you know, I, I didn't I didn't do it that way. But uh, how can you, you know, show me an Olympic gold medalist in swimming that didn't start um, swimming when they were, you know, six or 10 or 12. They've been doing it for years and years. And the way that they did it is they turned up every morning at 5 a.m. to the pool, you know, so that was goal number one, objective one, tick. Um, objective pool two is get in the pool, tick. Objective three is to punch out the laps. And how do they punch out the laps? They do it stroke by stroke. So you can't move forward unless you're in the moment taking small um, and decisive action. Um, and at any point in time, you know, they – we are humans of our own free will. And I know there's a lot of pressure on Olympic athletes and particularly when they've got some talent at a younger age, they may have felt like they couldn't stop. But there is, uh, I'd say that there are thousands and thousands of potential um, gold Olympic gold medalists that decided to stop. Yes. Many more than, the, than decided to go on. So um, the thing is that there was a choice to go on. But I, I think, you know, high performers, they, I uh, used this analogy last time, at Nick, is, it's like if I took you out in the middle of the ocean and dropped you in the water and said, you know, you're three kilometres off, or five kilometres offshore, and I said to you, you, you need to get back to shore, um, you would probably look up, look to the shore, see a landmark, say a, um, a lighthouse. And you go, right, I'm going to head for that lighthouse. The only way to make that happen is put your head down and take the first stroke. Thank you so much for supporting Move Your Mind. We're expanding the offerings of the organization and we're tailoring everything we do to suit you guys and to try and answer to all of your needs and the questions that you send in. The book is available globally. You can find all of the links at nickbrax.com slash book. And we've just released the Move Your Mind community. We've currently got a men's community group, a women's community group, a general group. We're going to be lo loading up other groups and you can find all of the links at moveyourmind.me. This group's been created based on the needs of what we've heard and learnt throughout running Move Your Mind. And we have live events. We've got courses. We've got huge amounts of value, the ability to share information, share ideas, work in groups together to, to grow and share your learnings, to learn about different topics. You get email reminders. There's a whole lot of features in there. We're constantly updating it and we're so excited to share it with you. You can find all of the information about it at moveyourmind.me. And that happens in the moment. So forward progression happens with what you are doing now in the moment. And yet a lot of the time we, what, what we do in this analogy is we would bob around in the water looking at the lighthouse, you know, just overly focused on where we want to go as opposed to what we want to do, why we want to do it, and who do we need to be while we're doing it. 
And that that's all bringing the person back to the moment. And, you know, I, I say to people, uh, I get people who come to me and, and um, I work with who are about achieving goals. And invariably, we don't end up talking much about their goals. We end up talking because goal goals are about achievement. I work in the space of performance, and they're two different things. If you can get your performance really, really good and high quality, then the achievement will just come. It will just happen. So all you need to do is to be able to, you know, in the analogy, stick your head up occasionally to have a look at where you are how close you are, maybe even turn around and look to where you've come from. Look, look how far I've come. You know, I can do this. Then you stick mm -hmm. your head back down and you stay in the moment and you keep stroking. It's about, you know, keeping the, the goal on the horizon as this fuzzy sort of thing that I'm looking at, but being very crystal clear in the moment about what you're doing and who you are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, falling in love with the process or trying to, enjoy the day-to-day -day process of whatever it is that you're doing or trying to achieve because i guess that is our life and if we don't enjoy it we can't control what the outcome is but we're going to look back and be like well if i was just you know grinning my teeth and hating every moment of it then what was the actual point even if i do achieve it you know you that's a big it's a big chunk of our lives but i think and like you're saying there it's i and I, i've been or i still am in the sort of entertainment acting industry and I'm very much an infant in that industry but what I've observed is I've seen so many good actors that have dropped off and quit because they aimed so high and they got so overwhelmed and frustrated that they only last for a certain period and the one thing I've heard anyone in that industry say that has achieved is the only thing that you should do is just don't quit just keep going you know you you can't navigate you can only navigate to a certain degree how it's going to turn out. But if you just keep fronting up and keep going and stay in the game, then eventually something might happen. And I think it's, it's so important. And again, you know, what you were talking about before with these self-help coaches or, you know, you hear people ranting on, you know, you just got to work harder and get up at 4am, sleep for four hours and do this and do that. Well, it's, it, it's not applicable to 99.9% .9 of people, you know, it's scientifically shown that, most of us need seven to eight hours sleep to, to function and to be mentally healthy. So it's actually going to be detrimental to your, your mental health as well. If you don't, if you listen to that stuff, so it's just not, it's not sustainable. Yeah. I, I think, you know, just on that point, it's also giving away your power. If you, if you're going to be slavishly following someone else's, you know, life program, I mean, is that now your life, you know, you need to really think about this mm. locus of control. It's like, you know, you've got to navigate your life. The, the book you read was about that person navigating their life. So take from it what you what fits for you because, you, you know, you're different both internally and your environment is different. Different. Your stage of life might be different. Your well-being might be different. All, all There's so many variables that won't necessarily match up to the book that you just read. So I, I'm a huge advocate of reading as much as you can. I've got you know, my, my wife, every time I walk in with another book, she rolls her eyes, but um, <laughs> you know, I've got like, uh, it's a nightmare when we move, there's cases and cases of books, but um, I think that's really important, but it's also important to approach it um, with a, an objective point of view, you know, with curiosity, that's interesting. Don't become a cult member and, you know, slavishly follow it. You need your tailored approach I think, you know, what you said before about actors that you know dropping out, um, you, you, you were touching on, on the concept of persistence and my story about not committing suicide about and then the dark years that followed, that was one of persistence. That was just, you know, get up in the morning and just find something to keep going. Um, and uh, so I think persistence is, is, really, is really important. Um, and that leads to two other things. The first one is that um, you're right. You know, the goal is just a goal, and we we have we all have them. But invariably, like how many how many of your goals have shifted during the process? You know, willingly, like you've gone. You know what? I, I think that this by going th coming this far through the process, 
I've now identified a new opportunity or a new insight or a new joy or a new love, and I'm going to take it in this direction now. So, you know, the veracity or the validity of the goal in the beginning, you've got to understand that it's a temporary, potentially a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. And it's also potentially something that you won't achieve. But if you do achieve it, let's look at what people do when they achieve goals. They generally set another one. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. like, hang on a second. So I, I've spent, yes. you know, 25 years saving up for this beautiful house that I live in. And now I've taken the keys and we've moved in. And now I'm looking at, well, you know, now I, I'm, you know, I might put a pool in, you know, now I might go, I might build up or, you know, it's like, oh, oh geez, I'd love to live in that other neighborhood. Or now I want an investment property. And, you know, all of those things are, are great, but just be aware that, you know, you, you achieved it. And for a, you know, a split second or maybe a day or a week or a couple of months, you actually reveled in the joy before you, it, it was, you needed something else. Yeah. And so was it the 25 years that to, of, you know, working towards it that was valuable or was it the walking into the house that, you know, when you die, you're not going to live in it. Was it that yeah. we need yeah. to work that out for ourselves and in those 25 years, it wasn't all fun. There was suffering. Um, and we persist through suffering by attributing meaning to that suffering. I think I spoke to you last time about my favorite author. It was a guy called Viktor Frankl, who uh, wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he's a guy who uh, was in the German uh, prison camps during um, – well, he's in Auschwitz, I think, during uh, World War II. And he was a psychologist before he went in. And what he noticed, um, he wrote the book after he was in, he survived. And he, he noticed that, um, that suffering was inevitable. But if someone uh, applied a really deep meaning to it, that they more than, you know, that, that they had a greater chance of getting through. Like, they mm -hmm. didn't die. They they didn't give up. They 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 didn't lose their will to keep going. And um, you know, he says he's got a quote that I love. Um, I throw it out there all the time. Suffering ceases to be suffering the moment that it gains meaning. Yeah. And I think that's a great lesson. Like this is a book I've given to all my kids and said, please read this book. But I think that that's you know we need to accept this is going to happen. We're going to have bad times, but it can be really, really bad if that's what I choose it to be because it's about my perception of what's happening as much as what's happening. You know, there's the, um, mm. the other one I throw out there is by a psychologist called Kirsch who says perception is not of the experience. It is the experience. Mm -hmm. So our, our life is how is the perception that we have of our life. And it, what that does is gives us back some control in times where we think that, you know, like the world is fucked and everything's, <laughs> everything's coming down on me. It's like, hang on a second. What can I do just to perceive this a little bit better? And that yeah. will get us through. That's, that's the base, the building block of persistence is that, that little bit of that perception that gives hope. Um, and so I think that that's, that's also really important uh, for people. My name is Nick Brax and I'm a storyteller who has dedicated my entire adult life to creating positive conversations around mental health. In recent years, discussions around mental health have become less taboo and entered the mainstream vernacular. I've delivered over 1,000 mental health seminars around the globe, including several TED Talks and I believe we all have a story to tell. In my book, Move Your Mind, I cover my story and stories from people that inspire me, as well as insights from world-leading mental health experts. This book will help you to learn how to recognize mental health issues before they become a problem. Use your personal challenges as motivators, take ownership of your well-being, and create new daily habits that increase happiness and reduce stress. I love that. I love that. It makes it it's yeah, it, it makes so much sense what you're saying with that. And, and yeah, it's like, it, it's choosing like what you're saying, choosing what you trying to work out what, what is the meaning of what I'm 
working towards and not, you know, not you still mm. should work hard and have these goals. But if it is just to get the bigger house and then keep adding to it, but the actual thing you're doing is not what you really want to do. Or, you know, you hear so many people that actually know what they really want to do, but they'll do something that they feel like is a safer option. Yep. And, you know, that's not ideal. It's not an ideal thing. And, you know, Jim, Jim Carrey, I heard him saying a story where his dad um, really wanted to be a comedian and he felt like he had to support the family and became an accountant, hated what he did, ended up getting fired from the job. And Jim Carrey said, well, if you can fail at what you hate doing, you may as well take a chance at what you love doing. And, you know, so it's finding what is the thing you want to, actually do and how can i how can i find within reason a way a way to do it maybe there's not maybe we can't do it on the level we want like the story you were saying earlier but we can find some middle ground with you know how we want to spend our lives yeah 100 percent. i think you know an, another way that i say this with my clients is that you know it is inevitable that you will have hard times you will suffer it is inevitable um a good way to approach that is to accept it and then find a way to suffer with purpose you know, that's another that. way of saying, give that suffering meaning. It's like, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, another analogy I use all the time is uh, people who do the Tough Mudder or the Spartan race. You know, as an ex-military person, I, I can't get my head around paying to go and do something like that. that was, they used to pay me to do that. But um, why do people do it? I mean, clearly that's physical and mental suffering to a degree. Um, but why do they do it? Because it has a, a, a purpose. They, they have a strong purpose for why they want mm -hmm. to put that, mm -hmm. you know, willingly put themselves through that. When we're, we're in a, a position where we're unwillingly there, it's even more important to be able to suffer with purpose, I think. So, um, you know, to try and dominate the unpredictability of those, um, those, those moments in terms of internally, not environment-wise, but um, in term, uh, internally. So, um, you know, coming, coming back to the present is really important, I think, with that. And understanding, like, there's, there's some really simple questions that I get my clients to run through uh, all the time, really. And the first one is, what's the most important for me, the most important thing for me right now in this moment? You know, bring back to the moment and focusing on what's important. Um, and then and then measure that with what's possible right now. And that sort of speaks to that continuum mm. thing that, you know, bringing back into having realistic expectations. And you can double check on that. Am I copping out? Did I just underplay myself? Is this still challenging? Yes, it is, but it is possible for me to, to achieve. It is possible for me to think like this. It is possible for me to um, to feel like this, so um, it it sort of marries those things together in the moment and just really simple. And and the locus of control is internal. It's me taking control of what's important. Uh, it's yeah. me taking control of what I'm going to aim for in this moment. So, yeah. And I think last time we spoke about you know this concept of the big me and the little me. You know, understanding mm. that is really I think key to to getting ahead with with life and and knowing what's going on in our brain which is really really complicated or our mind more, more to the point um and so i i sort of break it down into this duality just to make it really simple for people that there is a little me and the little me is mainly who we hear inside our mind chatting to us they focus on you know the little me will focus on the past um uh, or the future, but not the present. It'll be chaotic. It'll be about drama. So you'll, you know, it'll be about people. Um, it'll be like gossipy. Uh, there'll be blame and excuses. It'll be driven by sort of, you know, this feeling of anxiety and it'll be focused on the problem. And so yeah. if we can sit back and sort of hear ourselves and go, oh, I'm sort of ticking off on a lot of this stuff, um, that's probably the negative, uh, the, the little me. And then the big me is kind of like more more like the logical you. The the imagine a courtroom, it's the judge who's not involved, what wasn't there when the crime was committed. 
has no emotional attachment or agenda. It's just the, the judge listening. Um, you know, and some psychologists call this the wise mind, but that the big me is anchored in the present. The, the, they, the, it's the big me that asks what's important for me right now in this moment, what's possible for me. That's the big me coming in, asking those questions. Mm. It's calm, focused on solutions, logical, um, not, not focused on people, but on ideas and concepts and no blame, no acceptance. It's all about how do I, it's solution focused thinking. Um, and it's a, if we can slip into that when we need to, it's a good way to regulate the emotions and get some clarity in, in the moment um, and to be able to refocus on what we need to execute on now in order to get to where we need to go. And I guess that's why as well when you're, you know, when you are, you shouldn't make important decisions when you're being driven too much by emotion or if you're feeling overwhelmed or you're stuck on something, that's when you should in, the natural thing is I feel like I need to push on. I need to just, you know, grind my teeth and push harder. It's like you should just stop, go for a walk, clear your head, think about it. And whenever you allow yourself to do that and just calm down, then you think, oh, actually, you know what, I can look at this rationally and here's the step that is a better step. You can make a mistake if you, you know, if you're just reacting and letting the emotions drive you to whatever angle you take. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I think that... Um what that is actually doing is allowing little me to calm down and shut up for a moment and yeah. providing some space for big me to come in who sort of says, hey, hey, hang on a second. Uh, this, this, the crux of this issue is this. Let's focus on that. And then big me might leave again. And little me yeah. then says, oh, yeah, but, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get back at that person. And I'm going to show them. And, like, the, the ability to be able to hear that and sort of go, uh <laughs> hang on a minute, you're basically saying now's not the right time to make a decision because I'm not thinking with the right part of me. You know, I need yeah. to bring more of this other part of me in to get a, a higher quality solution. And you can see it in high performers all the time that they will, uh, you know, what you and I both love footy, but um, so I'll use that, you know, they'll have a, a shot for goal and they'll miss and you'll see that they're angry or they're disappointed or, You'll see they'll, you know, they'll say, fuck, you know, and they have this moment where little me is taken over and uh, the emotions are dysregulated. And But high performers really quickly drop it. It's gone. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't be little me. That's You also love really hard. That's little me as well. You know, yeah. so we don't want to lose little me. What we want to do is sort of balance it up a little bit. And you'll see it in high-performing athletes all the time. If you're a sport sporting person and you like watching sport like me, you'll see it really high performers don't hang on to the emotional stuff. They have it, they drop it, and then they get back into the moment. And yep. I think that that's a really great lesson for getting through life. I really like that. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. And super applicable. Um, going back to the PTSD, just to, to quickly mm. touch on that, um, how how difficult was that? And I guess for, you know, I know a lot of people listening have probably been through some form of it. I know a lot of people in the world have, and it's not talked about enough. How, how difficult is that to confront and and start to chip away at, you know, working, working forward from? Um, I think everyone has their own journey. So, um, it really, I, you know, my journey was my journey. So I, I it, and that was dependent on, you know, my upbringing, my, you know, um, the way my beliefs, my values, uh, but also the environment, the external environment, um, who I had around me, um, you know, the identity that I was, that I had, the, the workplace I was in. So I guess, you know, that's just a caveat, I think, that... Mm. Mm. This, it's going to be a bit different for everyone, but I, how difficult was it? Well, you know, in the moment, it was super difficult. I thought that um, it, it was like uh, it was like I was alive, but I had died. Mm -hmm. So mm. Um, the old me was gone forever, but I didn't know who the real the, who the new me was. So you know the, and I'm talking about really fundamental parts of me. Not, I'm not talking about, you know, who I saw myself as. I'm talking about 
the way that I slept changed. Um, you know, medication put weight on, on me, which fortunately I've now got back off. But, um, you know, so physically um, I had changed. The way I was thinking I had changed, the, you know, like it, there was there was things that had changed all through my life. The way I drive a car, the way that I reacted in a, you know, in a Westfield, in, in a mall, because, it, like I said before, we got hit by a rocket. Being around concrete was triggering me, you know. The way, the way that I um, pushed people away, the way that I socially connected, everything changed. Um, in some, some to a very high degree and some just a little bit. But overall, it was like, I don't know who I am anymore. And like, mm. this is like, what's going on here? Um, and layer on top of that, that I had no, I felt like I had no control. It was like, I just, I, I, if I could flick a switch and just go back, that's what I want to do, but there's no switch. So I've got, mm -hmm. I'm out of control type thing. So it was, it was really difficult to the core of who I was, like every single day, looking in the mirror, you know, physically, everything. Was, and 24-7, was, I guess, it's just sort of from when you wake up till go to bed, you've got that feeling. It just doesn't go away. Yeah. I, look, and there were times when it was like that. But, you know, I'll also, also tell you that there were some good times in there as well. There were times when, you know, I was able to connect with people. There were times where I was social. There were times where I found something where I got a bit of passion in it. The problem is that it didn't, didn't last. Those things didn't last. They fell apart. And um, looking back on particularly the five years after I got out of the military or the four years, um, that, was, that was the critical sort of suffering that, um, that I think I had some purpose in that. I, you know, at the time, I just felt like I was out of control. But when, when I look back, I was doing things like I was going to see a psychologist every, every week. I was doing, taking the medication. I was doing courses. I was looking for ways to replace an old identity and then found that, you know, maybe you don't need to replace an identity. You know, I was doing some really good reading. Um, all, and at the time, I wasn't sitting around with people saying, I've got PTSD and I'm suffering with purpose here look at the book I'm reading. It wasn't like that. It was, it felt chaotic and out of control and just lost. I felt like I was locked up in a, in a, in a black box and couldn't get mm. out. But looking back on it, there was clearly some stuff going on for me, which very, very small, um, in very, very small increments were getting me out of there. And I, I think I may have said to you last time, I used the analogy, it's like hair growing. Not, not that I've got much hair, but, you know, you, you don't wake up, every, you know, today and say, oh, geez, look at how much my hair's grown since yesterday. Like, you just don't notice it. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at a photo of you, you don't have a haircut, you look at a photo of you from a year ago, you go, wow, my hair was really short then and it's really long now. It was like that. So yeah. I, it was an, un, uh, you know, I, I wasn't able to intellectual, uh, in, intellectualize it at the time. But it, gra it gradually built, and each day was getting very, very minutely better for me mm. until I reached the point where I was able to take some bigger steps, you know. So these are all tiny little steps. I, was, I then took some bigger steps, and I was able to focus on my value and, and how, I was, how I was now feeling compared to what I was feeling. And that's another interesting thing. I think, you know, the PTSD has taught me to look back more than looking forward, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was mm -hmm. a great lesson, you know, That's because I, I measured my growth by looking back, by saying, you know, like 12, mm. you know, 24 months ago, I would never have been doing this. So I, yeah. I must be going okay, you know, whereas if I was looking forward, I'd probably be comparing myself to one of my mates who got a great life and doesn't have PTSD. So, um, yeah, for me, measuring backwards is, is really important. But um, that, that's what it was like for me. Um, my biggest issue was sleeping. Um, <laughs> well, people who were in my life at the time would probably say no, it was, <clears throat> pardon me, relationships. But um, I think lack of sleep compounded everything for me. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
It's a 10 year anniversary of Underbrax and we've relaunched with the classic white pair. We've also got new styles coming out super soon. We're donating a dollar from every pair to mental health, currently to one in five. You can find all of this at www.underbrax.com. Absolutely. And I, I love that point of, you know, looking back and how far you've come just in general with everything, rather because if we're always looking forward, we're never grateful. We're never content. We're always sort of longing for more. We can, you know, we're just going to be frustrated all the time. So I, I love that point. And oh, I was going to say, um, what are, what are some things you do now day to day just to in general to just maintain your mental health, well being? Do you have daily things you do, um, certain rituals, habits, anything like that? Yeah, I, I do. Um, but there's really only one that's a constant and that is breathing. So I do uh, tactical breathing or box breathing. That's my thing. So um, I, I guess I, I also, you know, it's a form of mindfulness. Um, it's something that I can do really quickly. It's just, you know, box breathing, four seconds in, hold for four seconds, four seconds out, hold for four seconds. And I do, um, and I do 10 rounds of that. But um, the, the, the way that I do it is not like a, um, it's a habit, but it's not a routine. And what I mean by that is that I treat that in the same way that I treat drinking water throughout the day. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, I might be sort of doing something, sitting at my desk, doing something, or just had a client or something, and then sort of go, oh, now's a good time to, to do a bit of that. So what I'm doing is deregulating my parasympathetic nervous system and upregulating my sympathetic nervous system regularly throughout the day by doing this sort of two-minute exercise rather than, you know, I think that that makes more sense for me because I, I don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I've got to drink two litres of water today and drink the whole two litres in the morning. Um, it doesn't work yes. like that. I don't eat yeah. all of my meals at once. So that's the way that I approach it. So I don't, it's not necessarily a routine, but it's a habit. Um, the other thing is, um, I guess that this is a form, that's a form of mindfulness, but um, uh, I, I can't really mentor and coach and teach what I do without really placing an emphasis on mindfulness in my life. So um, as much as I can, I bring myself back to the present moment. Now, I've got some weird stuff that that I tell people, you know, a really great place to do that is in the shower because you're not going to get distracted usually mm. in the shower um, unless you've got young kids. Um, but <laughs> in the shower, and in the shower is really good because you can ask yourself, you know, or tune into what's the temperature of the water? What does the water feel like on my skin? What's the sound of the water hitting my head? Uh, what's the smell of the soap? So you're utilizing all of those senses to, to bring yourself into the present moment. And it sounds really weird, um, but what it's actually doing is training me to be like my mind to be like that for the rest of the day. So mm-hmm. I do that. I, I do that sort of thing throughout the day. They're the only two things that I do um, on a regular basis. Other things come in and out. You know, I'm a, I'm, I read a lot. Um, you know, I'm an inquisitive person. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, I volunteer. I do a, a fair bit of volunteering. Um, and I think that that sort of helps me as well be grounded. So they're, they're the things. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Having those things, but then not not having certain things where it becomes a forced habit, like getting up and having to exercise, having to do this. You might still do those things, but you're not having to do it as as this rigid sort of daily thing, which it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. I really like that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I exercise. I just don't put my, myself, I don't put myself under pressure. You know, I yeah. might go and smash myself this afternoon, tomorrow morning, I might get up early and go for a walk. And, and that's that's okay. But, you know, um, what there, there's some parts of my life that I, um, I treat like brushing my teeth. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't get up in the morning and go, oh, should I brush my teeth today? Oh, I can't be bothered, you know. Um, I try and move it into the automated sort of thing. Like I wouldn't think twice about brushing my teeth. It happens. 
without any resistance. It's just it's just there. And I try and move it. some of the things in there. But, you know, the reason why it's so easy is no pressure. There's no pressure on brushing my teeth. There's not even thought about it. So there's exactly. other parts of, you know, self-care. And brushing teeth is self-care. There's other parts of self-care that I try quite hard to move into that basket. Um, and the primary method for doing that is to remove the pressure around it and to find the easiest possible way to do it. You know, like think about brushing your teeth. Everything is, is there on, it's, it's all there for you within arm's reach. It's really simple to do. I've even got a, you know, um, an electric toothbrush. I don't even, even have to go like that. So, you know, the, the principles of that, of how easy it is and how habitual it is, I try and move into other areas of my life as well. Um, not, not as successful as brushing your teeth, but, um, you know, I get runs of it where it does feel like that. Yeah, no, makes a lot of sense. So we've got um, five questions that you're probably aware of from last time that we finish each episode with. Um, so these can be sort of short answers, whatever comes to mind. Yeah. Um, before I go into that, uh, where can our, anyone listening to this, uh, if they want to learn more about you, look into the work you're doing, et cetera, where, where can they go? Uh, I've got a website. So it's uh, Kyle Tyrrell, all one word, K-Y-L-E-T-Y, double dot com dot au um or they could reach out on any of the social medias so um linkedin um uh, linkedin facebook instagram i think there's kyle tyrrell high performance leadership on all of those platforms great well we'll, we'll put the link to we'll have the link in the show notes for the website and all of your social channels so anyone listening highly highly recommend you guys check it out check out all of all of your, all of Kyle's stuff. Cheers, um, man. So these, sure. no, no problem at all. Um, so yeah, these final questions. Um, the first one is, what's the best childhood memory that comes to mind? Yeah, this will be. I think what I told you last time was um, just uh, being a kid, being in the backyard, laying on freshly mowed grass, that smell of freshly mowed grass, and playing with my two favourite matchbox cars. That that'd be my, you know, the sun beating on your back, not a worry in the world very contented. That'd be my best childhood memory. Love it. Uh, what do you think is currently the biggest burden on mental health in society? I, I think it's um, expectations. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and not, not necessarily that society places expectations on us, but that we're conditioned to accept them. I think so. We've spoken a lot about that in this show. So yeah, I think it's about just being self-aware, being more self-aware around what expectations are doing to the quality of our life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's your, we talked about happiness. What's your personal definition of happiness? Yeah. So I think I've already answered this one, a big contentment. Yeah. I think so yeah. seeing, seeing, being aware that happiness is that, that experience of um, feelings as opposed to contentment being um, a state of, gratitude and um, uh, joy and, and things, peace, calm. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, what are you most afraid of? Uh, what am I most afraid of? I think I struggled on this one last time too, didn't I? I think so. Um, it's, it's going to sound probably conceited, but I don't, there's, of course, you know, like I'm human, I get, I get afraid, I get scared, um, but I don't think I pay too much attention to it. Um, I'd say that it, it's about not, not being enough for my kids, not being the right role model, not doing the best that I could as a parent, but also as, as a partner, you know, if letting, letting, my, letting my wife down. Um, those two things would be the thing that I'd be, um, I, I don't think I'm afraid of them, but I think that I would be, that's what I'd feel most devastated about if I went down that track. Yeah. Yeah. And final one, what are you most proud of? Oh, uh, these are great questions, Nick. Um, what am I most proud of? I think 
I think being able to being able to talk about this stuff, <laughs> I think, you know, like <laughs> taking taking what was a very full life that had some very high highs and some very low lows, and then um, turning it into something valuable like all of it, all of the highs and all of the lows getting some value out of it and that value potentially being able to help other people. I think that that's um, what I'm proud of. I, I hope that I'm able to keep doing that and sort of get to the end of my life and feel like it was worthy. So I think that would be it. Yeah, I think that's a great one and a great way to end. And I know you'll definitely, I mean, you've helped me even just listening to you for a second time. It's helped me again listening to this. And I know that all of our listeners will get a huge amount of value out of it. So really appreciate you making the time, uh, well, the, coming on for a second time and, and doing this and um, have loved every minute of it. And uh, I'm sure our listeners will too. So yeah, really appreciate it. Well, cheers, Nick. I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I enjoyed talking to you the first time. I've enjoyed this one even more. So uh, like I said to you, you've got this um, incredibly natural way to make these conversations flow and feel comfortable and and i appreciate you for that appreciate it mate well i've enjoyed it more as well so um i'm glad we got to do it so thank you <laughs> cheers thanks to kyle Terrell for joining me today for move your mind and just another reminder that the move your mind book is now available globally all of the links are at nickprax.com book you can join the move your mind community by going to moveyourmind.me and we have re-released Underbrax with all of the products at www.underbrax.com.